Hey, sir. What's up? You have a great day. Hey, you as well. Thanks. Thank you. This is it, huh? Yes, it appears so. Yeah. Yep. How, how small is your smallest? One. Same. Yeah. When is it? It's Sleepy Seminar, Aaron Park. What period? Do you remember Damien Park or anything? Yeah. Yeah, it's his little brother. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's in fourth period. Uh, sixth period. Sixth period? Sixth period. I have a single during six. Yes. Yeah, we could have some... We could hang. Yeah, exactly. In one room, in two totally different places. <laughs> but it's better than being like, hey, weirdo. I know, right? It's so, like... I mean, I mean, this I'm is already to, weird. Yeah, I'm trying to convince my, my single friend to switch to another cohort. Because I'm like, come on, man. Like, yeah. we're prepping for the AP exam. You don't want to be by yourself. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to be helpful. Exactly. This is, you know what this reminds me of? Detention. Yes. Yeah. Not that I was in detention very often, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, I have to make this link available to the ones that are online right now. Do that real quick. Zero. Period. One. Well, let's just do this. Here. Um, should we do this? Three twenty-two. Well, good morning. So, um, right now I am streaming myself on YouTube just like normal. So that, but you guys are sitting in front of me, so I feel like I should address the room rather than just address it because that would be weird. You guys all show up and I'm just like staring at the computer screen. Um, so first of all, who all do we have in here today? <laughs> this is so bad. Is it loud? Natalia. 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 Brendan Ariana. Manaya. Lourdes. Okay, very good. Excellent. Is this is this what you guys expected? Was that it would just be the four of you in here? No. Is there was there others that you thought were supposed to be in here? Let me check on the attendance side of things. Very good. Yeah, I'll probably ask you guys to repeat yourselves a million times because I'm deaf. Um, okay, Lourdes, Brandon, Ariana, and then Nathalia and Manaya. That's it. That's you're the only four for A. So, and you are here. So that's great. I'm not wearing my mask because, well, I probably should be wearing my mask. There's a zero percent chance that you're gonna get sick from me, or I'm gonna get sick from you. So, but it's easier to talk without having that on. All right. So. We left off um, talking about child rearing in middle class families. So we're in the Victorian era. Um, and yeah, by the way, feel free if it's more comfortable to look at the one behind you, feel free. That's fine with me. I don't mind. Um, so talking about um, the Victorian era, this is in, in European history, this is the period of time of the uh, 1800s, okay, um, in, in 
England in particular, Victoria, Queen Victoria was like the longest reigning queen in, in European history until not long ago uh, Elizabeth II broke her record. But um, we're looking at how raising children or just in general family dynamics in the 19th century started to change a little bit. Um, there were there started to be lower mortality rates for children, okay, which means that you know previously when people were on farms, okay, and they had a bunch of kids, um, the, the, one of the reasons that they had a bunch of kids is because precisely because they didn't know if all those kids would be, would make it into adulthood, and so and two, you, you know what you guys may not understand is that back in the olden days raising kids, families were not really like they are now. They, families tended to be um, pretty cold. K kids were not raised in like loving environments. Kids were basically more or less expected to be little adults, little adults, and, and from a very young age were treated extremely harshly, um, frequently using physical punishments and other things like that. Um, and as we have progressed throughout later periods, um, uh, children, of course, there's a, there's a famous saying that came around right about this same time, spare the rod, spoil the child. In other words, spare the rod, in other words, don't beat your children with a rod, spoil them and develop nurturing, loving relationships with your kids. Um, there were lower mortality rates, which meant that uh, attachment to your kids became greater in some sense because there, there's an expectation that they're going to make it through childhood and into adulthood. Um, the high mortality rate that had existed in pre-industrial Europe resulted in mothers becoming indifferent to their children. Lots of times in middle class families in particular, if you had the money, you would hire what was known as a wet nurse, which is basically like feet, breastfeeding children was seen as um, uh, like peasant, like lower class thing to do. And so uh, if you had enough money, you would hire a wet nurse or um, you know, nannies and other things like that to raise your kids for you. And that's kind of like Mary Poppins again, going back to Victorian England, Mary Poppins. The whole reason they're hiring a nanny in Mary Poppins in the first place is precisely because the mom is from the middle class. It was very uncommon for moms of the middle class to develop those close-knit relationships with their children. Um, Lower rates of illegitimacy, fewer children were abandoned to foundling hospitals. There were also fewer children per family, and we talked about that last week when we were uh, talking about before we took the test, which I still have to grade. I'll be doing that today. Um, last week we talked about um, how in the so fewer children per family was that in the urban environments that we that we see people migrating to in the industrial revolution um, space becomes a, a highly sought after commodity and kids weren't allowed to work in mines or in factories as well anymore and every single time they have another kid and you bring that kid into your household in an urban environment you have to pay to feed them pay to clothe them um, and, it, and it becomes very expensive to have a bunch of kids um, there's an increase in books published on child rearing. Parents were intent on improving economic and social standing in front of their children, um, or for their children rather. Child rearing. Children did not remain economically dependent on their families. Boys and girls would frequently go to work upon reaching adolescence. Very common to be sent away. Uh, when you were in your teenage years in, the, in these days to go and work uh, elsewhere, uh, either in someone's house as like a servant or, um, you know, in a factory or, or, or somewhere like that. Young working class adolescents broke away from the family more easily uh, when emotional ties were oppressive, which I guess makes sense. And then um, middle class youth followed this pattern into the 20th century. Okay. Uh, I never know how to say that, but the end of the century, fin de sic, I think is how you say it, fin de sic. But uh, the Belle Epoch uh, from 1895 to 1914, we are going to be moving into, well, we've already been talking about the latter 19th century, the late 1800s. 
we are now going to be transitioning into the early 20th century, the century that I was born in, and, um, and which is crazy to think about, really, but the end of the 19th century brings with it some unique developments. Uh, first of all, first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, this entire thing called imperialism. Imperialism is when European nations, which by the way, European nations had been imperial up to this point already, but um, European nations start going to new places in Africa, in Asia, uh, specifically, you know, China has a lot of issues going on at this time. Britain had already been in China for a while, but um, as the late 1800s progresses, European nations enter into this national competition with one another to acquire as many colonies as they can. And um, some of the colonies that they acquire in Africa um, you know, end up not breaking away from colonial rule until the 1960s. So it's going to it's going to have a pretty significant effect. But uh, the Belle Epoque uh, increased standard of living in all industrialized countries. They sometimes think of them as the good old days. Uh, better living occurred in northern Europe, like Britain, France, and Germany. People were gradually uh, enjoying higher wages, lower food prices. There was also an increase in leisure time and disposable income. So people were starting to make more money. They had more free time. When they made their money, they were able to go and spend their money doing the things that they wanted to do, taking day trips, purchasing consumer goods for themselves. And we see increased consumption. Uh, and when I say consumption, I don't just mean like food or something like that. Um, increased consumption of goods and also um, activities. Like, for example, soccer clubs, sports clubs grew significantly. So some of the big, if you're a football, or uh, I mean not like a like a soccer fan, like a European football fan. Um, Manchester United, uh, Arsenal, uh, most of the big, like the big name teams in the Premier League came and started around in the late 1800s. And so these, these sorts of things, spectator sports, um, became for the first time ever like a thing in, um, the late 19th century during this, this Belle Epoque, the, the golden age or the good old days prior to World War I. And again, when we say the good old days, we have to understand that's coming from the perspective of a white male European. It certainly was not good old days for African Americans in the late 1800s, I can assure you that. But, um, but in Europe, this is where we start to see what we recognize today as a more modern society with um, with people buying things like bicycles or participating in sports clubs and other things like that. Okay, um, emerging sports culture, Im it kind of mirrored the growth of aggressive nationalism. You know what's funny about sports, people have these undying loyalties to sports teams. Now I'll just say this, I'm not a huge sports guy, all right? Um, it's not, that's really not my, uh, not my thing. I'm more of a music guy. But when you really think about sports, it's nationalism, but on like a smaller level, right? Think about it for a second. Like, it's so goofy. You think about these sports teams. Sure, maybe you're from whatever. Let's say you're a, what's a big football team? The Patriots, right? The Patriots. Let's say you're from New England. You don't know any of the players on the team. You know, you don't know. You don't know any of them. Whether or not what's his face wing, wins another ring, that's not gonna change your life. You know, we, we don't know these people. These are professional athletes. They make billions and dollars a year, and and here we are, and we're going crazy about them. For it's it's to me it's silly. The whole thing is so silly, and so but it's like. But it's precisely nationalism. It's like, why do you cheer for New England? Oh, well, I grew up in New England, and it like becomes a cultural thing, right? So this, this idea of worshiping sports teams is a microcosm of like nationalism, which is itself pretty interesting. 
Some social Darwinists believe that sports competition confirmed the superiority of certain racial groups, which of course became a big news story in the 1936 Olympics because Jesse Owens, who was a, a, a black athlete at the Olympics, Hitler showed up with all these German Aryan race athletes and then Jesse Owens beat them. And, um, and so that was really interesting in terms of setting the record right on on social Darwinism in sports, where of course, you know, black folks weren't allowed to play baseball in the United States for a long time and so on and so forth. So uh, cafes and taverns also started enjoying increased patronage in cities and towns, places where people could meet, congregate, spend their time, read the newspaper, have a conversation. Department stores growing dramatically. We start in the late 18, 1800s seeing stores like Sears. You guys even know Sears? Have you heard of Sears before? It used to be called back in the olden days Sears and Roebuck. And um, Sears used to put out a massive catalog with all sorts. You could buy a house from Sears, and I'm not joking about this. In fact, there are houses, um, there are houses that were built in the late 1800s that were that used these. Um, it was basically like a do-it-yourself house. Which sounds insane, right? Could you imagine like, oh, I'm gonna buy this house that I have to build myself from the Sears catalog. That's, no one would do that today. But the houses that, were, that came from that are worth a fortune today. It's a true story. Um, and you can't find them everywhere because very few people actually did it. But um, you, department stores, you used to be able to go in to a store like Sears and they would have clothing, they would have tools, they would have consumer stuff like kitchen items and so on. Different departments, that's where they get the name, different departments within the store where you could go to and purchase all sorts of goods, like a catch-all store. And there were a bunch of them. Montgomery Ward was another one. Um, J.C. Penney is another department store, right, which J.C. Penney's around today. But these stores have been around for a very long time. But this is the why this unit is kind of cool is because we start to see kind of the beginnings of what we understand to be modern culture uh, in the late 1800s develop. But um, in Paris, dance halls, concerts, and plays drew thousands of people each week. We also start to see some very important new inventions in the telephone. Okay, automobile, gramophone, which is the record player, or phonograph as it's sometimes called. Radio, invented by Marconi, uh, and then motion pictures. Now, some interesting uh, facts on this, okay, is so before the telephone, there was the telegraph, right? And it was like a thing, um, it, it's, it makes a beep noise. And it beep, 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 beep. Have you ever heard like a old school, you guys even know what I'm, you're looking at me like I've lost my mind. Have you ever heard of, do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a thing, they're on ships a lot of times, it's like on the, on the, on the Titanic, when they're like signaling for, duh, 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 duh. it's like SOS, you know? Anyway, it was an old way of communicating, you used to use Morse code, you had to tap Morse code through, do you know what Morse code is? Yeah, okay, through this thing, the telegraph, and it was sent on a wire. Eventually, when they came out with radio, they found ways of sending the signal over the radio waves, so it became a wireless technology, even though it's literally just beeps and, and stuff coming through the airwaves. Eventually, they invent the telephone, where you can pick up and you can actually hear your voice through the line on the other end. Um, and, of course, now, I mean, everybody has a telephone. But then automobiles, another big thing. Mercedes-Benz rolls around probably about 1870 eight or somewhere in that region, okay? Um, but we start to see other automobiles like Ford come around as well by the time that we get to the turn of the century. Um, record players, so back in the olden days, Thomas Edison is the one who invented the record player, and they used to be cylinders. You know, these days you guys buy a vinyl, it's like a disc, it's like a large, you know what a vinyl is, right? Um, Back in the olden days, they were cylinders. They were about this big, and you would put put it on this kind of spindle, and it would roll the cylinder 
and play it. And they still exist. They're extremely rare and like priceless. But uh, the original record players looked pretty different from how record players look today. And then eventually they went to the disc format where it's a flat thing and it rotates on a table. Um, a turntable, as they call it. And then the radio. Radio's super important. Revolutionizes everything, really. Interestingly, though, radio was basically a military technology. Um, if you weren't if there was no reason for you to have a radio, you wouldn't have one. Like, in other words, like, if you didn't work on a boat that was trying to communicate with other boats around or whatever, um, there were no radio stations, public radio stations, for people to listen to bef uh, before World War I. We don't see the first public radio station emerge until after World War I ends in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and then motion pictures. So motion pictures movies, in other words, um, were very uncommon uh, prior to World War I. Very, very uncommon. Because film was expensive, and in order to make a motion picture, you need to basically take a bunch of pictures back to back to back, and it takes a tremendous amount of film. And, um, and the film technology was still kind of primitive at that time. So motion pictures were pretty rare prior to the start of World War I, which is in 1914. Uh, after World War I, or dur rather during World War I, sad but true story is that um, the first movie shown in the White House, okay, the first movie shown in the White House was shown by D, uh, by uh, Woodrow Wilson, but the movie was done by D.W. Griffith, and it was called Birth of a Nation. The first movie shown in the White House in, I think, 1918, maybe, somewhere in that area, that movie, Birth of a Nation, the Ku Klux Klan are the protagonists in the movie. They're the good guys, okay? That should go to show you, I know it's cringeworthy, right? Pretty much all of you just cringed at once right there. Um, the, the movie was shown in the White House by Woodrow Wilson. Now, the thing about the movie is from a, from a technological standpoint, like camera usage and stuff like that, having nothing to do with the plot, the movie was um, barrier breaking. That's the thing that's kind of unfortunate about it is that, like, new techniques were used for the actual filming of it that revolutionized motion pictures. But when you look at the storyline of the movie that they were making, it's horrible. And, um, and so super, super racist and bad. But again, going to show you just how far we've come um, in a little over a century, keeping in mind that 1918 was only 103 years ago, which is not that long. So. Uh, some new inventions of that time. Education. Okay, here's where we get to. You guys are all mandated to be here today, right? All mandated to be here. Um, how does it feel to be back in the classroom? Decent? Yeah? That's good. It's not normal, obviously. It's weird. But um, I wonder if anyone's saying anything on here. I haven't really been paying attention to the uh, live stream. Um, oh no, did my internet go out? Concurrent viewers, please check resolution. Huh. I wonder what happened. Maybe the internet went out. It says it's on. Let me refresh this really quickly here. Yeah. Um, unless I'm messing up the name. No, it's Jesse Owens. Yeah, Jesse Owens. Yeah, Jesse Owens was the Olympic athlete. I, I you startled me because I thought maybe I got his name wrong. N really? Jesse Owens, yes. Uh, Jesse Owens, Olympic athlete. Huge deal because at the 1936, the, those Olympics that year took place in Berlin, which is in Germany. And Hitler 
during this was three years before the start of World War II. Hitler had planned on like showcasing how great German athletes were, and Jesse Owens beat them, which is awesome. Yeah, really, really cool. So, um, I don't know why this stream isn't working. Oh, yeah, now we're good. Okay, so uh, let me address these questions here. Alicia, you posted three other sessions too. No, uh, just so only the sessions for period one. There we go. Um, can you screen share the slides? Uh, I can't. Let's see here. There you go. That's me screen sharing. Now, um, <laughs> that's the best I can do. I'm afraid. Um, okay, so education. Um, all right, let's talk about education. So the state's role in education increased, leading to further secularization of society. Because previously, remember that education was largely run by the church in Europe. Okay, so when kids went to school, you would be going to school through the church. Um, in their educational things here, the, the programs that they create, they emphasize loyalty and service to the state while decreasing influence of organized religion. Okay? So what, why, why is it decreasing the influence of organized religion? Because now that students are being educated through the state rather than through the church, the church is not going to have as much say over what is taught in classes, all right? Uh, when we talk about secularization, we're talking about making things non-religious, okay? So just like now, your guys' education here at a public school, which is run by the government, we don't have, like, religion classes in school, and your teachers don't teach you about, like, you know, their faith and stuff like that. Um, instead, they, they'll emphasize civic duty, right? They'll emphasize things that you need to know in order to be successful uh, citizens, okay? By 1900, free compulsory education existed in England for ages 5 to 12. Primary school, as they call it, elementary school, as we call it here. And then the fairy laws in France required primary, free primary school for children ages 3 to 13. Now, I think it's interesting that they say emphasize loyalty and service to the state. Because if you think about that, right, like, when you go to school, the school is, especially, I think, you know, it's, it's tricky because it's, I mean, I teach at a school, at a public school, I'm paid for by tax dollars, right? My paycheck comes from the district. And so, um, but we have to just call it what it is. There are certain things in the school that do kind of um, influence you, right? Um, in terms of, like, for example, let me give you an example. The Pledge of Allegiance, okay? The Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I don't have anything against the Pledge of Allegiance, it's, it's, it's fine, but from the time that I was young, and I'm sure from the time that you guys were young, right, you learn the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, like when you're in kindergarten or something, right? It's, you learn it when you're very, very, very little. But I want you to consider the words of the Pledge of Allegiance. Have you ever, like, stopped to think about them before? Okay, it's because it's intense. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice, with liberty and justice for all, right? This is, a, this is a, an intense statement for a little kid to be making. You are pledging your allegiance to a national entity from the time that you're very young, right? That's like, I pledge my allegiance to the flag, loyalty to the state right? This is what they're talking about in this slide here. Those kinds of things, saluting the flag and other things like that, very, very nationalistic. And because nationalism is increasing during the late 19th century, 
it should not be much of a surprise to us that we see these kinds of practices put into place. Schools are a great place to indoctrinate, okay? They're a great place to indoctrinate, just like a church is a great place to indoctrinate, all right? It's different because we're not talking about religion, but it's not that different. And I see this is the thing that is troublesome is because, you know, indoctrination can be very subtle. Um, and then there's other times where it's not so subtle. But, uh, like, I like to believe that one thing that the American education system has that, or at least in my classroom, that others don't, is that you have the ability to express your thoughts, right, and ask questions and challenge people's thinking. That's really what education should be about. Um, and, and there are not all places in the world that have those kinds of opportunities afforded to the students. So, um, all right, 808, fairy laws. We'll talk more about those in a little bit. Increase in literacy. Men had higher rates of literacy. Urbanites had higher rates of literacy than rural folk um, because schools were less common in rural areas. There were also higher literacy rates in Northern and Western Europe than Eastern or Southern Europe. And girls, of course, had less access to secondary education than boys, although schools for girls did increase. And many times families paid the cost, because remember compulsory education only lasted at that time up until you were maybe about 13 or 15 years old. If you wanted to go to school beyond that, you were probably going to end up having to pay for it. So, uh, but if you went to school as a girl, this was seen as improving your marriage prospects because you could um, find a better husband as a result of having an education. Scientific advances of the late 1800s. We see scientific ideas and methods enjoying tremendous popularity and prestige after 1850. To many, science itself had almost become a religion. And people saw the link between science and technology improving, making their quality of life, uh, improving their quality of life, making their lives better, like electricity and medical care, better understanding of uh, chemistry and bacteria and biology. And Louis Pasteur, if you've ever heard of pasteurized milk or pasteurized cheese or whatever, comes from Louis Pasteur, who developed the germ theory of disease pasteurization as fermentation caused by growth of living organisms. And the activity of these organisms could be suppressed by heating the beverages up very rapidly and then cooling them down again. And new knowledge helped reduce food poisoning, so it was less likely for you to become sick from your from your meal. I recently had food poisoning maybe about, it's been a while now, maybe about six months ago I would say. I ate the, uh, the um, sushi from like an Albertsons. Bad choice. Grocery sushi. Stay away. Uh, I was violently ill. Okay. Uh, Joseph Lister. You guys ever heard of Listerine before? Listerine? Like mouthwash? Okay, antiseptic principle in performing surgeries resulted in far fewer people dying from infection. Now, this is going to sound gnarly, but this is a true story. Back in the Civil War, for example, or the Crimean War in the 1860s, uh, like, let's say you got shot, okay? <clears throat> the likelihood of when you get shot, the likelihood, and you don't die from it, of you getting an infection is really, really high, bacterial infection. And bacterial infection can kill you if it gets into your bloodstream. It could be really, really deadly. And so they used to, if you like got shot back in the olden days, they'd have like, you know, let's say you got shot in the arm and you know, like saw your arm off. If you were lucky, they'd take the saw from the person whose leg they just sawed off and like wipe it with a dirty rag and then saw yours. That's if you were lucky, okay? Otherwise, they would just move on from one person to the other, no sanitation, no cleaning of the instruments, no nothing. Because they didn't understand like any of the, right? It's disgusting when you think about it. But um, Joseph Lister was the one who like came up with this idea of antiseptics. Like, let's dip this in alcohol and like clean it off before we use it on the next patient. 
And of course, this grossly diminishes the amount of people getting infections just because of using dirty instruments on other people between surgeries. So uh, diseases such as typhoid, typhus, cholera, yellow fever were now under control due to improved availability of vaccines. That's the other thing, you know, vaccines. It's funny about the whole vaccine thing because there's been... I would have thought that the anti-vaxxers would have been a lot stronger uh, resisting the COVID vaccination, but it seems that far more people would rather get vaccinated than not get vaccinated, it seems. Um, but, but vaccines have saved countless people's lives going all the way back to when they first started being used in the late 19th century. Chemistry. Dmitry Mendeleev uh, devised the periodic table in 1869. You guys taking chemistry this year? You guys have it memorized? Some of it memorized? They don't make you do that anymore? They don't make you memorize the periodic table? Oh my gosh, that was the hardest part for me, was memorizing that whole darn thing. I, we needed to know the atomic numbers, we needed to know all the like abbreviations. Oh god. They, we just got, it was a blank Mr. Witt's class. I was not a fan of Mr. Witt. Sorry, Mr. Witt. Uh, blank periodic table. Fill it out. And that was your quiz. Pretty intense, huh? Electromagnetism, Michael Faraday. Electric generators, which started to be used on streetcars, lights. And then August Comte, the father, quote unquote, of sociology uh, came up with positivism, this idea that all intellectual activity progresses through predictable stages and so humans would discover the eternal laws of human relations through soci sociology. And he believed that social scientists could help benefit society for everyone. Comte became, became the leader in the religion of science and desire for rule by experts. Technocracy, I believe, is what that's called. And then there's Charles Darwin, Theory of Evolution, Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. You guys have probably heard of Darwin before. He was a naturalist. Went and um, HMS Beagle was, I believe, the ship that he was on. And he went to the Galapagos Islands and observed finches and tortoises and all sorts of different kinds of creatures and said that... Uh, all life had gradually evolved from a common ancestral origin in an unending struggle for survival and that species most able to adapt survived. And Darwin's theory refuted the literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, this, of course, created a crisis in some churches. And then you have uh, Thomas Huxley, who was Darwin's biggest supporter, Darwin's bulldog, as he's sometimes nicknamed. And then we don't see the idea of social Darwinism come about until later. This is done by Herbert Spencer. Attention all students, please pardon the interruption. If you are having trouble with BYOD, please report to the cafeteria if you are in Building F. One more time, Building F, if you are having trouble with BYOD, please report to the cafeteria. Thank you. So um, he applied Darwin's theory to human society, and we have to understand that that. Herbert Spencer's idea of social Darwinism is not true Darwinism. It's, it's a very um, harsh way of looking at society. The idea being that natural laws dictated why certain people were successful and others weren't. And it was later used by imperialists in Britain, France, Germany to excuse the conquest of quote-unquote weaker, less civilized peoples, okay, according to them, all right? What I'm trying to say here is that this idea of social Darwinism is like very closely related to the concept of white man's burden, where it became Europeans' duty to go and civilize distant regions away from Europe, like colonies in Africa, South America, Asia, and so on. But, of course, that's not very nice. Um, and then it was used, of course, by industrialists to justify their wealth. Well, why is 
why am I a billionaire and why are there tons of people who are working as wage laborers in my factory? Well, I'm better than them. So, of course, that's what's going to happen. It's like, well, it's like a little bit self-justifying, right? Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's not a very good thing. But these ideas were very popular amongst the upper and middle classes. We talked a little bit about Freud. Uh, Freud is an interesting dude. He comes around... Freud comes around, let's see here, he really starts making a name for himself in the, like right around the turn of the 1900s. Now, Freud was a, an, a, an odd guy. We just have to like level with you a little bit about Freud. Freud frequently, I told you that their understanding of pharmaceuticals at the turn of the 20th century wasn't very good. And so Freud would frequently both use cocaine and prescribe it to his patients. Right? Not knowing, of course, that these days we know that that's an insane idea. Um, but in contrast to the rationalism of the Enlightenment, Freud believed that humans were largely irrational creatures. And this is important. So here's what, here's what Freud would say. Freud would say that the reason that people do things has to do with unconscious motives. Okay? Uh, Things, drives, impulses that lie beneath the surface of your awareness, you're not even consciously aware of them. To be consciously aware of something like, uh, I am consciously aware that I am wearing a coat, right? Because I am thinking to myself, I know, I can feel it, I can, I, I am conscious of it. Unconsciously, right, there are things happening around that I don't even notice that might be influencing me, right? Like, until I stopped to listen to it, you can hear the vent. Now your conscious attention is alerted to the vent, but that's been there the whole time and you've just been ignoring it, right? So unconscious mind. This is what Freud strove to understand better. And what he basically said is that people think that they're really rational, but what they don't realize is that there are hidden motives, unconscious motives, that actually drive people to act in a way that is very irrational. And this is what, this is, this is interesting stuff, right? And so Freud, Freud's got some problems historically, super chauvinistic, in other words, sexist, uh, not very scientific, you know, not very scientific, but a good thinker in the sense that he suggested that people aren't as rational as you think they are. We love to believe that the world is rational because people like living in a world that makes sense to them. But sometimes things don't make sense and people do things for reasons that they don't even know. And this is what Freud was trying to get to. And of course, sexuality was a big part of that, but also aggressive, violent drives and other things like that as well. Okay, the new physics. Marie Curie and Pierre Curie discovered the first radioactive element in radium in 1910. Ernest Rutherford in 1871 to 1937, split the atom in 1919 and postulated the structure of an atom with positively charged nucleus and negatively charged electrons. Max Planck, big name in quantum theory, subatomic energy is emitted in uneven spurts called quanta, not in a steady stream as previously thought. Laws governing the universe now seemed unpredictable. This is another aspect to why the 20th century is rather alarming, is because there's a lot of things going on in the early 20th century. Oh, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on. No, um, there's a lot of things going on in the early 20th century that people just really um, it, it, it rattles their foundation because um, previously to this, everybody thought that the world was completely dictated by the laws of Newtonian physics, Isaac Newton's laws of physics, as laid out in Principia. But when we get to Max Planck, Albert Einstein, what they start to realize is that the laws are not what they thought that they were, all right? People realize after uh, these new discoveries that the universe is not quite as predictable and, and rational as it appeared. The other thing is with art, even. You know, we're entering into an era where after World War I, the world is going to seem like a pretty troubled place. Um, after World War I, there's a lot of people who are very upset um, 
angry at Germany in particular if you're from France or Britain, but then also too upset because they may have lost a loved one, um, or they may be upset because they came home from the war themselves and lost an arm or lost a leg, or you know there was all these mental health problems that people experienced after World War One, and the the period of time after World War I is sometimes called the age of anxiety or the age of uncertainty because of how uh, upsetting the war was to people, but also just because the world seemingly didn't make as much sense as people thought that it did just 50 years earlier. Because all of these new ideas about physics are coming out. Well, now Newtonian physics isn't even right anymore, technically. Or now people aren't even rational anymore. Art changes. Previously, art was really constrained by strict rules and uh, structures. And then we start to see new kinds of art like cubism and surrealism come around. And these kinds of art uh, broke the boundaries, all of the barriers of art. Dada art uh, would be another example. All these art styles of the early 20th century. And so the fabric of what made society make sense is completely ripped apart by World War I. World War I ends the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, the Russian Empire. Four dynasties that had been in charge for hundreds of years come to an end at the end of World War I. All right, it's, it's, an amazing, um, it's an amazing period of time in history. And it only happened if you consider like 103 years ago. 102, 103 years ago. It's an amazing thing. The world is so different, unrecognizably different. If you were to take a time machine back one century, you may as well be taking a time machine to a different galaxy, because that would be about how much you recognize. I mean, it, it's really, it's, uh, it's something else. So, uh, what time do we have until in here today? Let me pull this up really quickly. I can't believe you're a distant relative of, relative of Jesse Owens. That's amazing. Well, I guess that answers that question. All right, um, folks, tune back in this afternoon for the second half of what I do today. <laughs>